Greetings and welcome to another session of Veterans of the Cedar Valley. My name is Tom Haggerty and I'll be your host today for this session. Um, over the past few sessions that we've held, we've had a variety of different veterans related subjects, including everything from interviewing a service dog to veterans from the various conflicts of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iran. Today's subject is a uh, a little different. Uh, we're going to have a, a guest with us, uh, Dr. David Roberts, who is going to speak on behalf of the local uh, organization who is sponsoring the arrival of the B-17 out at the Livingston Aviation. Um, the dates are on the screen right now, and uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. David. Dave, I can call you. Sure. And, Thanks, and Tom. And tell us what you, how you are involved in the EAA, first off, what that stands for. Love to. The uh, Experimental Aircraft Organization or Association is an international uh, association uh, based in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. Founded in 1953, the EAA has more than 180,000 members worldwide. Wow. We have over a thousand chapters. Uh, its primary mission is to promote the spirit of aviation. And they do that in a number of ways, but two predominant ways. They host, uh, in, in the month of July, the world's largest air show called Air Adventure, more commonly called just Oshkosh. And the second way is the Young Eagles program, which is, uh, involves children, kids the ages of eight to 17, can learn about aviation, spend time with pilots, spend time with, with uh, aircraft, learn about the fundamentals of flying, and in the end receive a fleet free airplane ride. Wow, and on the Young Eagles, just a side note, um, do they learn how to fly or do they just express an interest in flying? Well, they express, express an interest in flying. Um, they certainly are gonna learn the fundamentals in a ground school, uh, so they know what makes an airplane fly, but uh, they're gonna go along for the ride and obviously we can't let them fly. Um, I personally am an instructor, so I can kind of let some of my kids that go along with me take controls. And but, real uh, quick, what, what type of an aircraft do you fly? I fly a fixed gear uh, Piper Cherokee. Okay. Um, let's go right to our subject, which is uh, uh, kind of dear to my family. My father-in-law was on a B-17, and that's what the subject matter is today. Um, please tell us about the uh, B-17 that'll be here at the Livingston Aviation? Certainly, well, the, the B-17 was the workhorse of the Second World War. There were over 12,000 airplanes manufactured. We lost over 4,000 of those aircraft in combat. And there are only 10 of those airplanes still left that are airworthy. Including the one that's coming here? Including okay. the one that's coming here. Right. Uh, we are gonna host uh, the EAA's aluminum overcast. It's a G model B-17 that was uh, manufactured in 1944, right at the end of the war. Um, it is owned and has been fully restored by the EAA, and they uh, have missions to make sure that history is shared and that we have opportunities for those uh, to be able to learn about the aircraft and take a, a ride of a lifetime. I was always told that the B-17 was nicknamed the Flying Fortress. Um, was that just because of uh, how far it could fly or, or what? I'm not sure the history of the Flying Fortress. Every bomber had, had a name, and the B-17 was uh, noted as a very reliable aircraft. Um, there were faster aircraft, there were bigger aircraft, but pilots and crew usually knew the B-17 was going to get you home. <laughs> okay. Um, just for our audience uh, experience, we have a, a video that we want to show on screen now. Uh, concerning uh, the B-17 and the actual experience of being on there. Great. So please come back after the video. We're going to take a flight on a 1945 B-17G model. The enthusiasm that's in this aircraft when it takes off is unbelievable. You're going to have people yelling, you're going to have people hollering. Once 
those aircrafts in the air, you're going to get an opportunity to get up and walk anywhere around that aircraft, and they all come up on the flight deck, and they all get to go in the nose of the aircraft, and you know, then get to be in the radio room in the back area of the aircraft. They grab these machine guns and stuff like this. They're putting their self back there in that time. They want to think, you know, gosh, look at this, my grandfather did this, or my great uncle did this, and, and that's the stories you hear. Everybody's got a story about what their great uncle or a family member did, and for them to turn around and experience this, or even some of them bring on board clothes and hats and pictures, you know, in remembrance of their loved ones. You'll, you'll have tears in some of these folks' eyes, and that's, uh, that's something to me. For them to be able to do this exact same thing as a family member did, I think it's real touching to a lot of people. Just brought back a lot of memories, and that's that's what made, it made me feel good. You know, it made me feel good to feel just that vibration of that airplane. You know, it's not like flying on United. You know, it's a. Brrrr. You get inside and you can just feel what went on, uh -huh. you know, with the with the crews. It's just a, they still yeah. spit out the same dirty oil and, yeah. and well, need a lot of cleaning to look yeah. like this. We got it set up and then we yeah. just went boom right down the can Ogden Canyon. Oh. It was spectacular, awesome, yeah. awesome. <laughs> 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 well worth it. Something else. Something else. Pretty cool. And then to look back, and then you're looking at the tail, and you're just seeing everything go. Now, where did, where did, what windows did you see? Did you all see out? We, you get to go through the whole plane. Once you're up, and you get your seat belts off, they let you just go through pretty much the whole thing. Yeah, it was spectacular. The airplane is excitement. It's energy. It's passion. Uh, and above all else, it's a tremendous tribute to our World War II veterans. Welcome back after that short video about the B-17. Um, the reason we're having this program is that a B-17 will be uh, coming here to Waterloo, and I'm visiting with Dr. David Roberts, who is a member of the Experimental Aircraft Association chapter here in Waterloo or the Cedar Valley. And uh, Dave, if you would, would you please tell us uh, on screen, there's the dates showing, but uh, tell us about the show dates, the times, and how people can enjoy this uh, replica or this B-17. Absolutely, Tom. Uh, the B-17 will be available on uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, June 12th, 13th, and 14th. It will be at Livingston Aviation, which is just west of the main terminal at the Waterloo Airport. Um, the 17 will be available for viewing throughout the day, but if you want to get close and personal, uh, the ground tours start at 2 p.m. in the afternoon, uh, where you can actually learn about the B-17 and actually uh, visit right through the, uh, the aircraft. So people who want to just walk through the aircraft can just, does it cost to do that? There is a $10 charge <clears throat> per, per uh, person or a $20 charge per family. Children under eight are free, active military, and veterans are free. Okay, and then they get on at the front of the plane, which was, I take it, the nose. That's correct. And I was in the Air Force. Uh, and then they would walk through and exit through the back. Through the rear. Okay. That's correct. They're going to really see the aircraft, the air, all the systems. Uh, they're going to be right up into the cockpit area. And it's a marvelous experience. Is there? Can they actually touch things inside the plane? Absolutely. They, they won't go off or anything. No, they? They, 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 they can't get into the cockpit, but they can get right up by it. Okay. And uh, you're going to see the radio room, the bomb bays, uh, and the rear of the airplane. Okay, let's talk about the experience of getting on the plane and taking a ride. Is that going to be available? And give me the details of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Um, first of all, I'd like to say this is going to make a great Father's Day gift. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. For somebody that has any kind of an airplane interest uh, or just a history buff, uh, the rides, um, if they're pre-booked, are $449. Walk-up are 475 to pre-book. 
I think the graphic is on the screen, but you can go to b17.org to pre-book a ride. Um, and it is about an hour event. Uh, you'll get a, a pre-flight and a post-flight briefing and about 30 minutes of actual airtime where you can uh, go anywhere in the airplane. So the flight is actually about an hour long on screen. We're showing it being the flight taking off. Um, so for, uh, but it's a half hour actually flying over the area and then coming back and, and it, making that experience. Um, when, when people take off, are they in, buckled into seats? Or Absolutely. They, That's when you will be given a position in the airplane, but the position doesn't matter because as soon as wheels are off and up, you're free to unbuckle and to mosey anywhere in the airplane okay. you'd love to. You're right. It would make a, a nice uh, Father's Day gift or a veteran that might still be around from exactly. World War II that was on a B-17. B um, let me ask you, are there going to be souvenirs? Yes, this actually comes with a full supporting staff, ground crew, and a full trailer that does bring uh, B-17 memorabilia. So there will be many things to, uh, to be able to look at, and uh, if some captures your fancy, maybe some spend some money on it. And what, what are the sales of the uh, trinkets, for lack of a better word, and the cost of the ride and the tour? What happens to those proceeds? It all goes back to keep the airplane flying. This particular airplane. This particular airplane. This is, uh, it's obviously a very expensive endeavor to keep those four radial engines uh, running and maintained, but this is a, a labor of love to, to those of us in the, in the EAA. All of them are volunteers. Most, most all the crew are volunteers. How long have you been involved in the EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association? Right. right? Okay. Uh, my wife and I have personally been involved with the local chapter about 15 years. And how many members locally? We have 80 members here in the local chapter. Oh, wow. And yeah. Uh, would you get, give me a guesstimate of how many people in the Young Eagles have taken flying lessons and gone on to be pilots? Oh, I can't guess that. I have personally flown over 125 Young Eagles, and I would say many more in our chapter have flown even more than that. So. It, it is truly um, something that we love to do. We love to share our uh, fascination of aircraft with young people. Well, I, I, we're coming to the end of this half of the show, Dave, and I want to thank you for being here to explain this uh, marvelous event that will be out at Livingston Airport, uh, a B-17, one of 10 left that is actually flying and bringing that here to the Cedar Valley for potential people to ride on and experience some of the history. And I wish you luck on the, you. the membership on, the, on that weekend. And, and uh, I encourage anybody that would like to uh, be, go on the B-17, whether to take a tour of it or to go on an actual flight to uh, contact the information that was been shown on the screen uh, to get, get involved uh, in the flight. Uh, we've come to the end of our first half of this session of Veterans of the Cedar Valley. We're gonna actually be interviewing a veteran who served on the B-17 named Cleon Wood. So please come back. You're watching Channel 15, Cedar Falls Community Television. continuing a, a World War II uh, session. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, service on the B-17, and I'm very proud to have in the studio uh, a veteran of the B-17 flights named Cleon Wood, who is a resident, born and raised here in Cedar Falls. And welcome to the show, Cleon. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy to have you here. and. and we're going to try and just uh, share with our viewers uh, some of the experiences that you went through in World War II and also, I understand, into Korea. Um, let's just start off with uh, uh, when, what age were you when you joined the Army, Cleon? Well, 
I joined in 19, September of 1942. I was 21 years old. 21. And had you gone to uh, Cedar Falls High School? Or, oh, yes. And then uh, after that, you decided you wanted to go into the, uh, I'll make sure I get this right, the Army Air Force? Yes. Okay. Um, did you have that uh, desire to start learning how to fly, or did you well, get that out of basic training? I just training? knew I would, would like to be in the Air Force because I always liked to be around aeroplanes. Okay. And, and did you have an airplane before you... Uh, uh, oh, join? No, I didn't. Had you ever flown it. before? Well, I, I went up uh, a couple times when there was a Ford Trimotor coming through Waterloo Cedar Falls. And there was one time out uh, on West First Street that, that at a farm out there, there was had airplanes out there. And I flew in a, a cabin plane of the Des Moines Register, I believe it was. Okay. Um, well, when you went into the service in 42, I was six years from being thought of. So that's, <laughs> I mean, you've got, you've, you're 94 years old. 94, believe, yes. Man. Congratulations on that. Um, let's talk about uh, when you went into basic training. Uh, did you, where did you go for your initial basic training? Well, that was a, for some reason, it was kind of strange. I never went to a, through regular basic training. I went right from Camp Dodge uh, where I enlisted down to Coffeyville, Kansas, which was gonna be a, a basic training for pilots. Mm, okay. And so they they tried to give us a little basic training down there, close order drill, order of arms, mm -hmm. and so forth. Learn about discipline and, and yeah. all that. Now when you went there, was the intent for you to become a a pilot or a specialist on no, uh, on a plane? it was just uh, part of the ground forces there. Okay. When I got, the, for, got there, they was just kind of building the camp up. And uh, it was in the rainy season, and we were spent our time uh, building boardwalks around in the barracks area to keep out of the mud. Were you being trained at that time on the plane itself no, no. that you ended up no, on? No, it wasn't until later. <clears throat> uh, I was uh, took an opportunity to join a band, military band there because I played in the band in the, here in Cedar Falls, and uh, because it was better doing that than detail work, like kitchen. What I yeah. I told the guy that was going to be the commanding officer that opportunity come along for me to go to school somewhere I wanted to be released mm -hmm. so uh, he honored that when it co did come time they were forming a permanent band squadron and they uh, didn't want to let me out but I had a verbal agreement with it and he honored it so I got to go to Amarillo Texas to aircraft mechanic school. Well let's move forward to that lovely town in Texas, Amarillo, is uh, when did you actually uh, finish your training to be put on a B-17? Well, I went to several other training places after uh, Amarillo. I had went to a factory school at Lockheed Vega in Burbank because they, they had a subcontract from uh, Boeing for building B-17s. Mm -hmm. Went through a factory school there. And when I got done there, I, I was up in uh, by Salt Lake City, a small arms training. Then I went to to, uh, to uh, uh, down there in Arizona, Kingwood, Arizona, for gunnery training, what, which was all on B-17s at that time. Okay, after all of that training, uh, when did you get to be placed on a B-17 with a crew? Well, after I finished my training there in the gunnery school, I got home for the first time after 13 months. And that's when I got married. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to Salt Lake City and that's where a crew was formed and my crew was formed there in Sioux City, or in Salt Lake City. And uh, then uh, 
very fortunately, again, I had a lot of good luck in all my service. I ended up going, coming back to Sioux City for three months or so for my crew training. Okay. And now, when you, let's, let's move over overseas. Did you leave from the United States to a station overseas with your B-17 crew? Yes. Okay. And where, where was that located? Where did you go for a base overseas? At uh, Attleboro, England. Stephen Green was the name of the base. Do you remember the first time you went on a on a mission? Well, I I I, I don't remember all of the missions, but the, some of them were more important than others. Sure. And my first mission was actually not with my crew; it was a replacement gunner. Okay. And uh, it was over in Belgium, and then. Uh, uh, very memorable on our first mission of the crew, we went into eastern Poland. Okay, and then on the screen is a list of uh, the missions that you flew, and you were telling me that I had asked you something about when did you get to rotate home after so many missions, and you indicated, I think, that you had enough missions, but they kept changing it, and then they just kept increasing the number. How many total missions would you say that you flew uh, overseas? Well, I was actually credited, I think, for 31 missions. Okay. There's some skepticism in there that there might be a couple more, but I think they were, we were assigned to the replacement uh, spare in case somebody had to drop out, but we didn't actually go on the mission. I'm interested, and I know our viewers are interested in, when you went on a mission, were they all just a piece of cake, or did you run into any trouble, or did you have damage to your plane? Well, uh, some of the missions I had were fairly uh, light, like I guess I'd say they were not heavily defended by an aircraft fire, but some of the other ones were very densely uh, protected with an aircraft fire. Do you recall any major damage to your plane that you well, received? I never had a real good opportunity to go out and examine it after we got back. There were a couple of missions I had where we had received a certain amount of damage. and uh, But other than that way, I was uh, very well protected by my prayers to God. <laughs> you were actually the rear, t uh, tell me again, the rear tail? Uh, top turret. Top turret gunner. Yes. So you were strapped in. Oh, there's an example on the screen of the plane. Oh, yes. And then uh, did you have to stand the whole time that you took off and came well, back? Well, they did, uh, later on, they did have a kind of a strap-in seat that you could use. Mm -hmm. But I never used it because I, I didn't want to have difficulty getting out if I had to bail out. What was the gun that you manned? Uh, 50 cal two, twin 50 caliber. Okay. How many people were on your plane, on your B-17 crew? There was 10-man crew. There was six enlisted men and four officers. And, uh, it, uh, and right now... I'm the sole living member of my crew. Did you keep in touch with your crew? Well, some of them. Okay. I always kept in pretty good contact with the co-pilot. I had a very good relationship with him, and that was kind of unusual with an enlisted man to have that kind of relationship with an officer. The service that you gave not only to the United States and, and, and protect, helping them to take back and, and restore freedom in France and, and Germany is what it was all about back then. And yeah. uh, um, when you got done and came home, thank goodness, um, how long had you served in the Army Air Force or in the Air Force? My total time, totally. three years, one month, and four days. And had you uh, signed up for that amount of time or... 
No, no, you just for the duration of the war. Okay. Uh, one thing I'm interested in, you know, it's been a long time since uh, since you went on those missions over France and were in the, the service. Uh, I think last year there was a uh, display out at the airport uh, of a B-17. Yes. And uh, did you get to go see that? And Well, I not only got to go see it, why, well, I, uh, I got a ride in it. Oh, you actually got to ride around yeah. the Cedar Valley? Yeah. Oh, they, there's a picture on screen yeah, right now. Picture. Did they let you fly it? No, no. <laughs> uh, I, I did fly one for about 15 minutes when we was in Sioux City in our training. But uh, that little fellow in the center there, well, they honored me to take him along with that, me on that flight. Okay. And uh, he, he was eight years old at the time, and he was very, very interested in, I suppose, not in only me, but in uh, B-17s. When you, i just take you back a minute to your experience on the plane. Uh, what equipment did you wear as far as, uh, did you have an oxygen mask? A, oh, yes. A, a bomber jacket or what? Uh, no, we, we had, um, very fortunate when I started to fly, period of time I started to fly, they had developed an electric heated flying suit. Oh, okay. Prior to that time, when you, you wore a sheepskin lined leather flying suit. That's very normally bulky. The, yeah, that's normally the picture you see with the collar and yeah. stuff. Is that because it was really cold in that plane? Right. And uh, they had a different type of an oxygen system. It was a, a system where you adjusted the amount of oxygen as you went up in altitude. The time I started flying, it was automatically done with a little diaphragm in there as the air pressure got less, it opened up and allowed more oxygen. Wow. We um, went on oxygen at 10,000 feet. And normally that's what height the, the plane flew? Well, it usually flew around 26 to 28,000 oh, feet. Okay. Um, when you were flying on a, on a B-17 uh, during World War II, uh, can you recall what the closest call was that you had uh, from the enemy? Well, probably was on that first mission uh, as our crew to, to Poland. We come very close to getting shot down. Over Poland? Uh, yes, yeah, so we were attacked by three German ME-410s. It was a twin-engine fighter bomber. And uh, there was two stragglers, and that's what they like to find because they don't have very many guns shooting at them. Mm -hmm. and they, they shot those. The first one blew up. The second one, the tail broke off. Then they started coming in on us. And I called the gunners up the way they were the planes were staggered and said, make your shots count because we are hit. Mm. And we got credit for a probable and one shot down. You know, I want to let you know that um, B-17 service was something that was required they called it the Flying Fortress, and uh, there was a reason for that because it was a long-range bomber and it was well built. And yeah, there was uh, 13 guns on it. Wow. Well, I'd like to thank our viewers for joining us for this session of the Veterans of the Cedar Valley, and I'm especially tickled and proud to have had uh, Cleon Wood, who also will receive a 70-year membership certificate uh, to the American Legion, of which I am the commander. and and Cleon was there before me. But uh, thank you again for joining us, and I hope that you'll come back for our next session of the Veterans of the Cedar Valley. Thank you. <laughs>